Order. It being 2 p.m., questions without notice. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Can the Minister confirm that the Morrison government has spent $500 million less on bushfire recovery than it has announced and has failed to spend a single cent from its $4 billion emergency response fund on resilience or mitigation works? Why is the Morrison government failing to deliver to help Australians recover and prepare for bushfires? The Minister representing the Minister for Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you very much, um, Senator, for your question. Um, what I can confirm, Senator, is that, um, that every person that has been impacted by bushfires, all bushfire-affected communities, uh, that we absolutely are committed but standing by them to support them in their recovery. Um, in reference to the numbers that you have just put on the table in relation to the bushfire recovery fund and, and the funding that is made available on an annual basis to support bushfire mitigation into the future um, is a fund that is put in place and it has a very specific purpose and it also has some very specific conditions around it, Senator. Uh, and one of those conditions is that, that the all other sources of funding to support bushfire recovery have been expended before that particular fund comes into effect. And the $200 million annually that is made available as a dividend from that fund to support our recovery and our mitigation um, per, uh, activities going into the future. As you would be uh, well aware, um, that we have spent more than $1.8 billion um, in support um, of our bushfire recovery. Uh, you know, $1.2 billion, if you'd like me, um, I'm quite happy to go through and to table um, in relation to the areas in which that $1.2 billion has been spent. But uh, you conflate a number of issues, Senator. You conflate there is a significant difference between uh, the bushfire recovery expenditure that has already occurred to date through a myriad of different programs that have been administered across many, many portfolios in government and the fund that you refer to, which refers to the money that is put aside to assist Australia in putting in place mitigation factors, uh, mitigation factors into the future, which, as I said, Senator, it requires all other forms of funding to have been expended before that one is activated. Senator, what a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. In, in Bega and Cabago, towns devastated by the last bushfire season, community organisations are still crowdfunding to upgrade toilet blocks and build evacuation centres in preparation for this bushfire season. Why are communities being forced to crowdfund for toilet blocks and evacuation centres while the Morrison government's $4 billion emergency response fund sits untouched? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. But as I have said to the Senator on numerous occasions, there has been a, a, a huge range of programs put in place to assist our bushfire-affected communities, uh, including the, the, the communities in which Senator refers. Uh, and, and if you'd like me to, I'm quite happy to go through a number of programs. You know, for instance, the support that's been provided, uh, you know, to some more businesses in the in these communities. But the fund to which you refer. Uh, Senator, is a specific fund with a specific purpose, with a specific set of criteria. Uh, and, and Senator, uh, the funding that once all other funding has been exhausted, that fund will come into effect. And that fund is in place into the future to make sure that we are always in the place year after year after year to be able to put funding in place to assist these communities to prepare for next year. The funding which is currently being expended is the Bushfire Response and Recovery Fund from 2020. Senator Watt, final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The Prime Minister says he doesn't hold a hose, but he does hold the taxpayer's checkbook. Why hasn't he delivered the funding he announced? Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Well, Senator, I reject the premise of your question because I believe the Prime Minister has um, not only um, has been a, a very strong Prime Minister in making sure that funding has immediately been made available to many communities across Australia, um, and, and, and that funding is out the door, as I have already said. Uh, the total spend on the bushfire recovery has been $1.8 billion, and this, uh, this includes the National Bushfire Recovery Fund and existing support. Support mechanisms. Um, so, Senator, you conflate two different funding pools. 
you know you're conflating two different funding pools uh, because they have two different purposes. The bushfire recovery uh, funds that have been made available to our communities that have been so devastatingly impacted by bushfires have been expended in our communities. The fund to which you refer to has a completely different purpose. Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister inform the Senate how the Morrison Liberal National Government's strong budget measures and economic leadership is ensuring our comeback from the COVID-19 recession? Order. The minister representing. Can we, can we at least let the minister commence his answer before we get disorderly interjections? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator McGrath for his question. Mr. President, the Australian economy is proving to be remarkably resilient as it strengthens Order. and comes back from the COVID-19 induced recession. Senator Today, Kennelly. the national accounts for the September quarter show that the recovery of the Australian economy is well underway. The Australian economy grew by 3.3 per cent for the September quarter the strongest quarterly growth rate since 1976 and ahead of market expectations of 2.5 per cent. It follows, of course, the COVID-19 induced 7 per cent fall in the June quarter. Technically, the COVID-19 recession may, in a technical sense, be over, but our recovery continues and the government knows that there is significant hard work ahead. We know that many Australian households and businesses continue to do it very tough. But pleasingly, the national accounts saw growth, strong growth in every state except Victoria for the September quarter. Our growth is being driven by household consumption, which grew by 7.9 per cent for the quarter, the largest increase on record. It contributed some 4 per cent to real GDP growth for the quarter. Consumption was up across 17 categories, with the largest contributors being health, hotels, cafes and restaurants. Many sectors where small businesses and employees have been doing it tough, and we welcome very much the fact that they are coming back strongly in terms of their recovery. Our government's goal has been to make sure that Australians are safe from the virus and to keep Australians in their jobs and to help them to find a job through these tough times. We have been succeeding in these goals. Over the last five months, 650,000 jobs have been created with the effective unemployment rate down from a peak of 14.9 per cent to 7.4 per cent. The Morrison government strongly contributed to this recovery with $257 billion in direct Order, economic Senator support Birmingham, time and continues to invest. Expired. Senator McGrath, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you. Can the minister advise how our economic comeback has been upgraded by the latest report from the OECD? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, the OECD has released its latest economic outlook report, and that report has upgraded Australia's economic growth outlook. Order. The OECD notes that the COVID-19 pandemic Order. continues to exert a substantial toll on economies and societies, with global GDP expected to contract by 4.2% in 2020, and indeed across other advanced economies an average fall of 5.5%. However, in Australia, the OECD has improved their forecast for Australia. Previously, they had forecast a 4.1 per cent contraction. They now expect that to be 3.8 per cent. This, of course, is well above and better than the forecast for those other advanced economies. It's proof yet again that Australia's successful management of the health crisis and the economic crisis is delivering improved and better results for Australians compared with the rest of this world facing Order, global Senator pandemic. Senator Birmingham. Senator McGrath, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister outline any other economic news that shows how the government is building a stronger and more secure post-pandemic Australia and ensuring our comeback? Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Senator McGrath and Mr President. Well, yes, indeed, leading up to uh, today's GDP data, we've seen uh, a range of different data points that show the recovery is well and truly underway. Unlike those opposite who seem to think that this is all just a political game that they can heckle and jekyll about, ultimately these are serious issues that deal with the lives, jobs and businesses of Australians. We're pleased to see consumer confidence is up 2.9 per cent. Indeed, it's increased for 12 of the past 13 weeks. Payroll jobs data was up again this week. 
This is the third consecutive fortnight in which we have seen positive payroll jobs data. Building approvals rose by 3.8 per cent in October to be 14.3 per cent higher through the year. These measures are all about ensuring better job security for Australians, better prospects for Australian businesses and the recovery of Australia's economy from this global pandemic. Or Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Yesterday, the Governor of the Reserve Bank, Dr Lowe, confirmed that unemployment in Australia will remain high for at least the next two years, saying, and I quote, a further rise in the unemployment rate is still expected. The unemployment rate is forecast to decline next year, but only slowly and still to be around 6 per cent at the end of 2022. Why is the government congratulating itself on the economy when there are 2.4 million unemployed or underemployed Australians and the jobless queues are still growing? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Gallagher, for your question. The Order. Governor of the Reserve Bank uh, had some things to say today as well. He did. To quote him, he said, Senator We have White. now turned the corner and a recovery is underway. No, it does, Senator. It does. And it's offensive that you would suggest otherwise. It matters a great deal. And indeed, in my first answer, just given uh, to the previous question, I was very clear in acknowledging that there are Australian businesses and households who are still doing it tough. We know that. This is a global pandemic that Australia has faced, and we've faced it Order. better than the rest of the world, and we've faced it as a nation. We don't take full credit as a government by any means. We know this has been a partnership a partnership with hard-working Australians, a partnership with Australians in business who have Order. come through these tough times, a partnership with the states and territories Order. in terms of their responses. At every step Senators of the way, we Gallagher. have sought to work with Australians to get the results that have kept Senator Australians in a much better place. Now, I don't know whether those opposite would rather be in any other country Senator of the McAllister. world right now. But I tell you what, most Australians know they would rather be here because in Australia they are safer than they would be in virtually any other country in the world. And in Australia, their jobs and their businesses and their livelihoods are safer than in virtually any other advanced economy around the world. That is the result of the type of policies that have been deployed across Australia. But it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that the crisis is over. Far from that, we know very well. There are more Australians to get back to work. There are more Australian businesses still doing it tough. That's why the budget we handed down this year, our economic recovery plan, focuses on job creation, investment driving, the things Order, that will Senator help the Birmingham. recovery Senator continue. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. The Reserve Bank Governor also said, and I quote, in the September quarter, the wage price index increased by just 0.1 of a per cent to be 1.4 per cent higher over the year. Dr Lowe went on to say that wages growth would continue to be subdued going forward. Why is the government congratulating itself on the economy when workers and families have suffered with stagnant wages and will continue to under this government? Senator Birmingham. Oh, Mr. President, Mr. President, Order. the government is absolutely focused on getting Australians back into work and creating strength in the employment market yet again. When we went to the last election, one of the key achievements that we took to that election was the creation across the Australian economy of more than one and a half million jobs during the work of our first six years in government. And it absolutely devastates us, as we know it does many parts of Australia, at the fact that this pandemic has created chaos in many of those jobs and, of course, the households who depend upon them. But what we do welcome is the fact that we've seen 650,000 jobs come back, recreated, over the course of the last five months. This is about making sure that we do get Australians back into work and that in getting them back into the work, we recreate strength in the labour market and through that across the wages Order, market Senator too. Birmingham. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary Thank question. You. Uh, Minister, three million Australians are currently relying on JobKeeper and JobSeeker to get by. 2.4 million people are out of work or not getting enough hours. 337,000 young people are on the unemployment queues, with more to join them by Christmas. 
Why is the government congratulating itself on the economy when widespread economic pain is being felt by millions of Australians who are being left behind by the Morrison government? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, let me again deal with uh, this attempt by the opposition to run some sort of congratulatory theme. The only congratulations I offer are to hard-working Australian businesses and their employees who have come through these tough times. They are the ones that we congratulate for the fact that they have absolutely responded to this crisis with support from the government. No doubt with support from the government. You cited some of those supports, Senator. You cited them in terms of JobKeeper, the single largest intervention in an Australian economy ever. We created it. Our government has extended it. We created it and we extended it. But in this year's budget, we also outlined the next steps in terms of the economic recovery, outlining the fact that driving private sector investment is about job creation for the long term sustainable jobs for the long term, getting the investment that absolutely generates business growth for jobs Order. growth Senator to keep Birmingham, it going. Time for the answers expired. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr President. My question is for the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the latest ABS labour force figures for October show the underlying resilience of the Australian economy and how the Morrison government's economic leadership through the COVID-19 pandemic has supported jobs and our economic comeback? Order. The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. And I thank Senator Chandler for her question. And Mr. President, when the Treasurer earlier today Order. was updating the Australian Order. public on the national accounts, this is what he actually said. The road ahead will be long. It will be hard and it will be bumpy. But the Australian economy has demonstrated. Sorry, Senator Cash, could I ask you to move to the next microphone and I'll ask the broadcasting to move to the next mic speak into the next microphone at the vacant seat. If broadcasting can turn that on, there was some static from your, yours. Sorry. Maybe no well, mic at all. Uh, if I, I know. I'm having no trouble. I'm having yes. trouble hearing the minister, so I'm not going to ask them to turn it down due to disorderly interjections. Please continue, Senator Cash. Uh, well, apologies. Mr. President, as I was saying, the treasurer said that the Australian economy has demonstrated remarkable resilience. And it actually has, because what today's accounts show is that the Morrison government's economic plan is helping to create jobs, it is helping to boost our economic recovery, and it is helping to secure Australia's future. And as the leader of the government said, we have now seen GDP growth in the third quarter return to positive territory, growing by 3.3%. And Mr President, this is reinforced by the latest labour force figures for October, which do show that with the further easing of restrictions across Australia, businesses being able to reopen their doors, jobs are returning to the economy. And in fact, the labour force figures for October they show that labour market conditions across Australia do continue to recover, with employment increasing in October by 178,800 over the month. And indeed, Mr. President, when you look at what the market expectations were versus what the employment growth actually was, 178,800, it far exceeded market expectations. And when you look at the breakdown, the breakdown of those jobs, full-time employment increased by 97,000. This is the largest monthly increase on record, and part-time employment rose by 81,000. 800. We also saw an almost 1 per cent increase in the participation rate. So Australians are putting up their hands and they are saying we want to go back to work. But Mr President, this doesn't happen by accident. This happens because of the strong Order. policies Senator that the Cash, Morrison government the is putting has in place. Expired. Senator Chandler, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister inform the Senate how the October results build on the jobs recovery we've seen in recent months and how many Australians have found work again since the pandemic began? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, again, as we recognise, as the Prime Minister recognises, as the Treasurer recognises, there remains a long road to recovery. But what Australians also want to know is that we are on the right track. They want to know that the policies that we are as a government putting in place to support them and to support their employer in keeping their jobs uh, open are actually working, and they are. In fact, Mr President, more than 75 per cent 
of those who lost their jobs have returned to work. That is actually a good thing for those people. 75 per cent who lost their jobs are back at work. And when you look at the last five months, around 648,000 500 jobs have returned to the labour market since employment fell to its lowest level in May. And pleasingly, as uh, Senator Payne knows, almost 343,800 jobs were actually for women. Australians actually want to be given hope, and certainly Order. the employment Senator Cass, figures time do for the just answer that. Has expired. Senator Chandler, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, the coalition government had put in place the economic policies to support the creation of 1.5 million jobs. How will the government continue to support the recovery of the labour market and build on this record of supporting job creation? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, the resilience of the labour market is actually on show with the employment figures, and in particular over the last five months. But that is because Australia entered COVID-19 from a position of economic strength. That is actually a good thing. You want to enter a pandemic from a position of economic strength, because what it means is you have a chance of surviving it. And that is exactly what we are seeing happening. As we know on the government side of a chamber, Governments don't create jobs. Employers do. Businesses do. Our role as a government is to put in place the economic policies that will help businesses keep their doors open, prosper, grow and create more jobs for Australians. And that is exactly what we're doing. And that's why we have our job maker plan. It builds on our strong economic record, empowering businesses to prosper, grow and create more jobs for Australians, which is what we want them to do. Senator Griff. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to Senator Cash, representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development. Minister, given the government is underwriting key domestic routes through the Domestic Aviation Network Support Program, or DANS, and that state borders are reopening, what discussions or agreement has government reached with the major airlines about the prospect of returning flights to normal by Christmas? The Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Cash. Um, thank you very much, Mr President. And uh, I thank Senator Griff uh, for the question. Uh, Senator Griff, my understanding is, or I've been the government is actually having, as you know, ongoing discussions, ongoing discussions uh, with the nation's domestic airlines uh, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, and we will continue to do that. Uh, because, as you know, at the aviation sector, uh, it has been severely, severely impacted. Uh, by COVID-19. Both domestic flights and international flights are down significantly. Um, and unfortunately, thousands of workers, thousands of workers uh, in the sector have been stood down. You'd also be aware, though, that in terms of the support that we've provided to date, it's around $2.7 billion uh, so far to support the aviation sector. This includes support to maintain minimum air services across Australia including over 400 return flights per week to more than 120 locations, of which more than 110 are regional or remote. $120 million has been paid to airlines to support critical connections on Australia's major routes, and over $30 million has been paid to airlines to ensure essential regional air networks uh, can be maintained. As you know, though, uh, the reality is international borders are still closed, and as such, the Australian government wants domestic travel to get back to normal as soon as possible. The recent challenge we've faced, though, has obviously been in relation to uh, state and territories at some time having their borders closed, uh, and sometimes at very short notice. But encouragingly, both Queensland and indeed my home state of Western Australia uh, have recently announced the opening of their borders to Victoria and New South Wales. And what we are now seeing as a direct response to that is increase um, or strong demand for flights returning already. But what we will do is continue Order, to talk Senator Cash. with the aviation Time sector. Time for the answers expired. Senator Griff, uh, supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Minister, a number of my constituents and other constituents have experienced extraordinarily high fares in recent times. And an example I can give yesterday were a flight to Adelaide. Um, a number of flights were actually cancelled uh, in what appeared to be a move to uh, maximise loadings and profits for another flight that ended up being four times the price of the original. Um, what are you doing in relation to price gouging 
that some airlines appear to be undertaking. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Griffin. Certainly, the government's expectation uh, is that our nation's airlines, as we do with any business, uh, they abide by the nation's consumer laws and they are treating their customers fairly. The airlines are contractually required to provide commercially competitive ticket pricing on subsidised flights. Uh, the government support seeks to maintain a level of competitive tension in the domestic aviation market, uh, for example by supporting both Qantas and Virgin on the same route. Under the domestic aviation network support, government assistance reduces in direct proportion to the revenue airlines earn on supported flights. Uh, and under the contracts, airlines provide weekly data in arrears at the time of invoicing to access commerciality triggers to enable the department to confirm if commerciality triggers actually apply. Senator Griff, a final supplementary question. Minister, a little bit of clarification on your last statement. But does the DAN's underwriting agreement of flights continue to apply if an airline operates additional prof profitable services on a DAN's specific route? And will you table the DAN's agreement with Virgin and Qantas? Senator Cash. Uh, Senator Griff, my understanding is that in uh, relation to the domestic aviation network support contracts, uh, the contracts with airlines are actually commercially confidential and as such uh, are not for publication. Uh, and in relation to the second part of your question, um, I would need to take that on notice and provide you with that information. Senator Canavan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, uh, my, my question Order. is to the Minister Senator representing Keneally. the Minister for Resources, Water Senator and Northern Gallagher. Australia, Senator Rustin. Because I live in central Queensland, I know how important mining jobs are to all of our communities and all through right throughout regional Queensland. Can the Minister, can the Minister update the Senate on the outlook for mining projects that will continue to employ thousands of regional Australians. Minister representing the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia, Senator Rustin. Order. Order. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you very much, Senator Canavan, for your question uh, and understanding the huge importance that the resources sector plays in Australia, but particularly up your way in uh, in Rockhampton, uh, in that economy. And the government in which we are a member, the Morrison McCormack government, understands how extraordinarily important uh, that the resources sector is and the role that it plays in creating jobs yeah. and investment in Australia, but particularly in regional Australia. The sector is an absolute key pillar of our economic prosperity and it will be absolutely crucial to ensure that Australia's economic recovery is strong. Uh, in fact, in August this year, the resources industry was employing over 247,000 Australians, and that's an increase of more than 6,000 since February. Um, and we know the importance of giving regional Australia the best opportunity, and we will continue to back the resources sector as one of the largest and most important employers in Australia. And even in the midst of the once in a century, the largest economic shock in a hundred years, this sector continues to support um, our regional communities and committed and, and provides great support and commitment to the training of new workers, with some eight and a half thousand new workers have been recently trained. Uh, and the latest report on resources and energy major projects for 2020 identified a really bright future for many of our major resources and energy projects, including a 19 per cent increase from last year in a number of major resources and energy projects under development currently in Australia. And these 335 projects have a value of $334 billion. Uh, and as the Prime Minister said, our focus right now is protecting Australia's health securing jobs and livelihoods and setting Australia up to make sure that we are stronger when the coronavirus is over. Senator Canavan, a supplementary question. Th thank you. Thank you, Minister, and thank you, Mr President. Uh, can the Minister please outline how the Liberal National Government is supporting regional resources communities to build new industries and create new jobs across regional and rural Australia, particularly across northern Australia? Senator Rustin. 
Thank you very much, Mr. President. And um, whether it be gas, whether it be iron ore, whether it be critical minerals, our resources industries continue to invest in our economy, bringing jobs and long-term yeah. security to regional Australia and regional Australians. And the recent resources and energy major projects report identified the broad spread of opportunities that exist uh, in the resources investment across Australia, including Queensland and the Northern Territory. And as, uh, as you probably are aware, Senator Canavan, in Queensland alone there are more than 50 projects generating billions and billions of dollars for the Queensland and the Australian economy. Um, as well as the projects uh, in Major Canavan's home state, Yesterday, the Minister for Resources announced that we're helping fast track a $1.5 billion project to mine phosphate in Senator McMahon's home state of the Northern Territory. This project, which is 200 kilometres uh, from Tennant Creek, will operate for 25 years, creating 900 jobs in construction and five, Order. 250 Senator jobs Rustin. ongoing. Senator Rustin, Senator Canavan, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, can I ask, is the minister aware of any risks to, to the mining industry and, and the jobs that uh, they provide in my home state of Queensland? Order. Order on my right. You're not meant to make your own minister's time difficult to be heard. Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, the one thing I can absolutely assure you, Senator Canavan, is this government, the government of which you and I are a member, remains absolutely committed to supporting the resources sector in this country. And that's why, in the 2021 budget, the Morrison McCormack government invested $125 million to extend the Exploring for the Future program for another four years and $52.9 million for the gas-fired recovery package. This investment is absolutely crucial uh, for Australia's economy, especially now that our internal borders are, are starting to open up. These measures attract investment, they deliver jobs and they secure a reliable, low-cost energy pipeline for manufacturers, industries and for households. And I know, Senator Canavan, you've been a very vocal supporter of the expansion of the new Ackland mine in the Darling Downs, and it was really disappointing uh, that we've been waiting several years for its approval by the Queensland government. Investing in mining is a great opportunity for this country. Order. Senator Seward. Thank you, Mr President. Mr President, my question is, the, is to the Minister for uh, Social Services, Family and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Minister. On the first of, through you, President, on the 1st of January 2021, the new rate of the coronavirus supplement will result in an extra 1.16 million people living below the poverty line. Is it government policy for people on the job seeker payment to live in poverty? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and thank Senator Seawitt for her question. The one thing that the Morrison government, uh, the Morrison McCormack government, is absolutely committed to um, is to making sure that we support all Australians by providing um, a safety net for those people who find themselves without work. Um, but Senator Seawitt, um, we recognise that, that we have been through a once in a hundred year crisis and the impact of that crisis has been severe across our entire economy and that's why we put in place the coronavirus supplement and a raft of other measures to support Australians through this crisis. As part of that, we have made decisions um, on a regular basis about how much additional support um, that we need to continue to put into the economy to make sure that we support Australians through this really difficult time. Um, we put in place the coronavirus supplement back in March and we continue to have that supplement in place. Uh, it continues in place at the moment for the three months to the 31st of December, and then from the 1st of January it will remain in place at a rate of 150. Order. Senator Seawood on a point of order. Sorry, I asked. I kept my preamble really short, and I asked a pretty short question. So could I ask the minister, through you, President, to get to my question, which is: Is it government policy for people on the job seeker payment to live in poverty? Um, you're quite right. You had a short preamble. I mean, I'm listening carefully to the minister's answer. She is directly addressing the issue of payment and that payment and supplement, at least to what I've heard. I've allowed you to restate the end of your question. I can't instruct her how to answer the question, Senator Rustin. 
Um, thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, well, Senator Seward would know very clearly that the absolute priority and policy of this government is to make sure that we work with the Australian economy, with the Australian public, with all Australians to make sure that we have a strong economy that creates jobs so those people who find themselves in a situation where they have, don't have employment, the jobs are created so they are, are able to get to work. Because we know, as you know, Senator Seward, that people who, um, who are working have a higher standard of living than those that find themselves having to rely on on welfare. But the most important thing that we can do is to support Australians um, through the appropriate policy settings that we have put in place through this once in a, in a century pandemic to make sure that that ongoing support reflects a very clear balance between supporting Australians and recognising the shallow jobs market, but at the same time we need to make sure that we put the right incentives for Australians to re-engage with Senator the workforce. Rustin. Senator C, what a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. 1.1 million children are living with parents who receive the coronavirus supplement. What do you say to these children who will miss out on a proper Christmas this year because there is no certainty about the job seeker payment? Good question. Senator Rustin. Well, um, thank you very much, um, Mr. President, and I'd once again thank you, Senator Sewitt, for her follow-up question. Um, I obviously don't accept the, the premise of her question. I think that the, uh, the government, of which I am a member, has worked very hard this year to make sure that we put additional supports in place for all Australians. And those supports remain in place today and they will remain in place after Christmas into the first three months of 2021. And we will continue to monitor the situation to make sure that we balance the supports that have been put in place to make sure that Australians are supported through this particular pandemic. And, and as Senator C would be well aware, the government has always been committed to making sure that our welfare system is targeted so that we are providing the level of support that individuals uh, to, to make sure that individuals get the support that they need to recognise their individual circumstances. So I reject the premise of your question that you first asked, Senator Seawood, and this government remains committed to supporting all Australians. Senator Seawood, a final supplementary question. The Productivity Commission recently found that mutual obligations and the income support system is exacerbating people's poor mental health. Do you agree that the low rate of income support and the punitive mutual obligations are making Australians' mental health worse? Wouldn't it provide certainty with a permanent ongoing increase of, job, of the job seeker payment being in place? Wouldn't that help the nation's mental health? Yes. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. The one thing that we are absolutely committed to is to make sure that Australians who want to work have the opportunity to be able to go to work. Because, as you rightly point out, uh, Senator Seward, people who, um, who are, find themselves without work um, find themselves in a more difficult situation and have lower uh, levels of, of personal wellbeing than those that are working. And that is why we are absolutely committed to make sure that we uh, put job creation at the absolute top of our agenda, at the same time providing yeah. levels of support to support all Australians through this pandemic. Um, the government um, released the final report um, to, in the Productivity, uh, Productivity Commission report to which you referred on the 16th of November, and we will very, very carefully uh, um, consult with stakeholders in relation to the findings in that report. Uh, and we will deliver a very comprehensive whole of government mental health and suicide prevention response to that report in the coming months. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. South Australia produces half of Australia's wine and 80 per cent of our wine export, exports. Exports to China reach $1.2 billion annually. What is, a, is the government's estimate of the prospective losses to the Australian wine industry and specifically to South Australia as a result of China's punitive tariff decision? and the effective exclusion of Australian wine from the Chinese market. How much damage will China's tariff do? Uh, what is the likely time frame for any Australian complaint about China's outrageous actions uh, to the World Trade Organisation? And is it not the case that the WTO's dispute resolution process could take well over a year, likely much longer? 
Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you very much, Senator Patrick, and, uh, for your question and also uh, some heads up time uh, in, about the subject that you will continue to ask about. Well, obviously, Australia is extraordinarily disappointed by the, uh, the, the actions of China um, to seek to impose a, a provisional anti dumping measure of between 107 and 212 per cent. Um, the Australian government is absolutely unaware of any evidence that Australian wine exporters have dumped their products in the Chinese market, um, and Australian exporters, we acknowledge, have worked very, very hard to establish themselves in that market. Uh, however, right now, the most important priority of the government is to work with the Chinese Minister, Ministry of Commerce um, for the 10-day period which we are currently allowed to make submission uh, in writing um, by the affected parties in response to this announcement. Um, Senator, I also understand that as uh, today, I'm not sure whether they have or they're about to meet the, the Minister for Agriculture, along with Senator Birmingham, the Minister for Trade, uh, will be meeting with the Chief Executive of the Australian Wine and Grape and Wine uh, Association, uh, Tony Batelain, uh, to discuss with them the implications of, of this particular um, action, should it be successful, um, on the Australian wine industry. Um, there is no doubt, Senator Patrick, that the impact, should this action be successful uh, and these pre provisional duties get brought into place, would be significant on our home state. Um, as you would be aware, um, of the $1.07 billion worth of wine exported to, to China, uh, over $800 million of that is actually comes out of our home state in South Australia. So right now we will continue to work with the industry to assess the impact should this go ahead, but our first priority must be to make sure that it doesn't happen in the first place, and we have a very short time frame in which to make that happen with the 10 days in which we have to make those written submissions. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr President. Given that China's Ministry of Commerce first announced that it was targeting wine imports in late August, three months ago, what plans for immediate assistance to our wine industry is the government now ready to implement? Will the government provide financial system, uh, assistance such as loans to help families, uh, family wine growers and, uh, uh, and, and makers survive in this abrupt disruptive uh, event? And indeed, uh, what are you going to do in respect of international, Order. other Senator international Patrick. markets? Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Patrick. Well, I, I, I wasn't in the meetings that um, that the trade minister and the agriculture minister had with the wine industry today, or, or are having with the wine industry today, where I'm sure that they will be discussing a number of things by which the Australian government can support the Australian wine industry um, through these particularly difficult times. But. One thing I can tell you is that the government has, over recent um, months and years, uh, working, for instance, to open up other trade um, market opportunities. Um, for instance, through the trade, the agricultural councillors that have been put in place in many of our um, highly um, profitable other trade markets. Uh, I believe we now have 22 trade councillors uh, that are working through the ASEAN countries to make sure that we continue to successfully um, build markets and get favourable trading arrangements with these emerging markets. Um, we also do things like the Export Market Development Grant Program, their free um, seminars and, tra and, uh, and trade advantage Order, opportunities. Senator Rustin, time for the answers expired. Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. In light of China's punitive actions, will the government suspend the wine export charge, the wine research levy and the grape research levy, which industry pays to Wine Australia, which in recent years has spent time advocating for in the, in the Chinese market. Will the government replace those industry le levies with a substantial increase in direct budget funding this year and across the Ford estimates for Wine Australia to ramp up its act activities, especially to promote things outside of the Chinese market? Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Patrick. Well, well obviously, um, I am not in a position to come in here um, and advise you of, of policy of which I am unaware. But one thing I can absolutely tell you, Senator Patrick, is the Australian government has, will, and will continue to back our exporters. Um, you know, for instance, you know, the, the government has a track record of, of standing up uh, for our wine exporters. Um, you know, we took um, uh, Canada 
to the World Trade Organisation and Canada agreed back in July this year to remove its tax and sales restrictions discriminating against Australian wine following Australia's initiation of uh, a World Trade Organisation dispute is an example of where we have demonstrated our willingness to back our, our exporters and our wine exporters particularly. Uh, and we will make sure in this particular instance that we work through all options to make sure that we can push back against this anti-dumping claim made by China so that our exporters are not unfairly dealt with. Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Emergency Management, Senator Ashton. The Royal Commission into the 2019-20 bushfire season recommended developing a national aerial firefighting cap capability warning and I quote, the increasing duration of fire seasons in the northern and southern hemispheres and the increasing duration and severity of fire seasons in Australia will make it increasingly difficult to share aircraft domestically and to acquire aviation services when we need them. The Morrison government dismissed this recommendation, claiming that the government is comfortable with current arrangements. Why? Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr President, and, and I thank Senator Chisholm for the question and um, inform him that there's no H in my name. Um, but um, look, thank you very much. You, you raise a very, very important issue. Aerial firefighting plays an extraordinarily important role in protecting uh, communities' essential infrastructure and providing the vital support that our bush firefighters on the ground so importantly need. Um, also, the National um, Aerial Firefighting Centre is an effective method for the government to be able to deliver critical emergency management capacity. And I know that the commissioners and the fire, uh, chief fire officers within each jurisdiction work very closely with that centre to determine the type and location of aerial firefighting assets based on the assessed bushfire risk. Um, this a collaborative approach is absolutely essential uh, right now as we enter into the bushfire season. We remain absolutely committed to supporting this important emergency management capability, and we know that our aerial firefighters are integral to the safety of our communities as they fight fires and deliver important resources when and where a disaster might strike. Uh, in fact, we announced a permanent increase in funding to the centre of $11 million a year, taking the annual contributions to in excess of $25 million. Um, additionally, um, we, the government supplements the operating costs um, of aircraft um, through the disaster recovery funding arrangements with the states and territories. Oh, sorry, oh. Senator Gallagher, a point of order. Um, Mr President, we've had more than half the time now um, relevance. The question was specifically about the recommendation uh, from the Bushfire Royal Commission and why the government had dismissed it. If the minister wants to table the brief she's reading from, we're very happy to allow that to be tabled, because, um, but an answer to the question would be um, preferable. I'm listening to the minister's answer. Um, I've allowed you to restate that. I, I think when a question is asked why a particular action is taken or not, not taken, that that is relatively open-ended. And as long as the minister is directly relevant to the subject matter, and I understand, at least if I correctly understand, she is talking about aerial firefighting capacity, I believe that is being directly relevant. Senator Rustin. Uh, look, thank you very much, Mr President. Well, the government has noted recommendation 8.3 of the Bushfire Rural Commission final report uh, and concerning the Commonwealth, state and territory governments adopting procurement and contracting strategies to develop a broader sovereign aerial firefighting capability. The government has clearly stated it has no intention of taking over the role of the states and territories, but it will work closely with them to ensure that we support aerial firefighting to keep Australia Order, safe. Senator Rustin. Senator Chisholm, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. The Royal Commission's report noted there were inconsistencies during the last bushfire season, and, and I quote, the requests for aerial firefighting assistance were not fulfilled because there were no aircraft available. Why did the Morrison government fail to ensure requests for aerial firefighting assistance were fulfilled? No plan. Senator Rustin. 
Well, thank you Order. very much, uh, Mr. President, and I uh, uh, thank Senator Chisholm for his follow-up question. Um, I think, to a large extent, I have answered your question um, in the first part of my uh, my question, uh, and that is that the Australian government is absolutely committed to making sure that we have a sovereign aerial firefighting capability that is appropriate for Order. the conditions that we find. Now. Um, we have a very comprehensive response to bushfires. We continue to work across jurisdictions, uh, and including acknowledging Senator Reynolds and the huge role that the military played in supporting Australians and our firefighters during the terrible bushfires at the end of 2019 and into 2020. Order. We remain absolutely committed to doing that. We also remain committed to making sure that there is a broad range of support put in place, whether it be making sure that we support telecommunications, whether we make sure that we've got wildfires, five um, things in place. But in terms of our aerial firefighting capability, we are absolutely committed to providing and working with the Order, states to Senator include Rustin. this. Senator uh, Chisholm, a final supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. Why is the Morrison government refusing to deliver the aerial firefighting capabilities required to keep Australians safe? Senator Rustin. <clears throat> Uh, thank you very much, um, Senator Field, through you, uh, Mr. President. Thank you very much, um, Senator Chisholm, for your question. Well, I would refute uh, the, pre uh, the context of the question that you have just put forward, because I don't believe that the Australian government uh, is doing what you've accused it of doing. I believe the Australian government is absolutely supporting the Australian public in making sure that we put in the capabilities to make sure that we keep Australians safe. We put those things in place last year through some of the most devastating bushfires this country has ever seen, and we remain committed to working with the order. states and Senator territories. Order, Senator Wong, on a point of order. The point of order, direct relevance, was a very, very specific question about the delivery of aerial firefighting capability, and I'd ask the minister to return to the question. You've reminded the minister of the question. I will continue to listen closely. The question did ask why and then asserted a claim about the government. As long as the minister is directly addressing the claim and the subject matter within it directly, I think she's being relevant. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, I, I, to, to the point of Senator Wong, um, I refuted the, the accusation that was made and the premise of the question that was asked in the first place, because I believe that the Australian government is supporting our aerial firefighting capacity through 159 aircraft, uh, providing Order. 185 services. You know, and if you'd like me to do, I can list Order. or put on the record all of those capabilities. Order. Order. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the minister update the Senate on the steps the government is taking to protect Australians against cybercrime? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President, and I thank Senator Patterson for that question, and I also thank him for his enduring support for our nation's security. Malicious cyber activity is increasing in our nation in its frequency, in its scale and also in its sophistication. In the last financial year alone, the Australian Cyber Security Centre had over 60,000 uh, reported cases of cyber crime. Today, there's over 2 million small to medium businesses here in Australia. Their cyber resilience is absolutely critical to our post-COVID-19 recovery. And that's why today I launched a new national cyber security campaign for small businesses. This new campaign will empower Australians to take responsibility for their online security. Led by the Australian Cyber Security Centre, it will provide regular, easy to follow advice for all Australians on how to protect themselves. The campaign will particularly target the major cyber security threats that face Australian businesses, and that starts with the first publications on ransomware. This campaign will be as agile as the cyber criminals that we seek to defeat. This government has made an unprecedented investment in our nation's cyber security. This includes a 1.67 billion announcement by the Prime Minister through the National Cyber Security Strategy. It also includes a $15 billion investment in enhanced cyber and information warfare capabilities for the Australian Defence Force and the Australian Signals Directorate. But cyber security is a shared responsibility for all Australians, and I urge all Australians to go to cyber.gov.au for tips on how to act now, how to stay secure and how to protect themselves and their families online. 
Senator Patterson, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Minister. Can you advise the Senate of how the government is supporting Australian small business owners against ransomware attacks? Senator Reynolds. Hmm. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I also thank the Senator for his question. Australians need to be aware that it is not just large businesses that are being targeted by cyber criminals. Small and medium enterprises are also being targeted. Ransomware attacks now pose the highest cyber security threat to Australian small businesses. Over the last 12 months, the Australian Cyber Security Centre has seen a 50 per cent increase in ransomware attacks. This week, the government, through the Australian Cyber Security Centre, has launched two new guides on ransomware. These guides provide very practical and easily implementable advice for Australian businesses. They advise how to protect themselves, how to respond if they are subject to a ransomware attack, and also how to recover from these attacks. I urge all Australian businesses to visit cyber.gov.au. Order. To download Senator these Reynolds. guides. Senator Patterson, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister provide an update on how the government is using its offensive cyber capability to protect Australians from cybercrime during COVID-19? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And again, thank you very much, um, Senator, for that question. Globally, malicious cyber actors are taking advantage, quite shamelessly and cruelly, of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. This government has continued to strike back against highly organised and highly sophisticated foreign cyber criminals. We have done this through an offensive operation led by the Australian Signals Directorate. The Australian Signals Directorate has collaborated with the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission and also the Australian Federal Police, using its offensive cyber capabilities to attack cyber criminals' tools and to disrupt their business models. These criminals are simply ruthless, and they are attacking Australian and targeting Australians by tricking victims into downloading advanced criminal malware onto their mobile devices. This ASD-led operation has protected hundreds, if not thousands, of Order. Australians Senator Reynolds, from time these the answer crimes. has expired. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. Yesterday, the minister failed to tell the Senate the exact date on which the government first became aware that robo-debt was not valid. On what date did the government first become aware that Mr Morrison's robo-debt scheme was not valid? The Minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr President, and thank Senator Wong for her question. Um, I had the opportunity since yesterday to um, consider the question that was asked of me by Senator Gallagher. Um, and I reject the premise of the question because at no time has there been a finding that the income compliance program was not valid. Your words. Order. Okay. They're your words. No, Order. they're not. Or Order. They Order. Senator Wong, Senator you've got Wong, the opportunity. Se Senator Rustin, Senator Wong, mm -hmm. Senator Wong, you've got an opportunity to ask a supplementary question. I believe the minister has concluded her answer. Senator Wong. Um, a supplementary question. Uh, yesterday, the minister used those precise words, not valid. So I again ask, when, I'm oh, sorry, you're right, it was on Monday. <laughs> on, uh, on Monday, you used precisely those words. I again ask the minister, uh, on which date did the government first beca become aware that the scheme was not valid? I also asked the minister how long it took between that knowledge and the Order. ceasing of Senator issuing Wong, of debt. Time for the question has expired. Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, and for the point um, to make sure that we are very, very clear, uh, on Monday I rose in this place and I was referring to income and averaging as the method by which debt, uh, the method of debt collection. I have never said. That uh, and, and I was verbal by Senator Gallagher yesterday that the income compliance program was not valid. They are very, very different things, Senator Wong. So I will stand by and I, uh, my comments, and I think that uh, if the, those opposite decided to review um, what has actually been said in this place, they would see that I did not say what I was verbal and uh, suggested that I said by Senator Gallagher. 
Um, so on that basis, Sen uh, Senator, uh, the, there has never been any finding Order, that the income compliance program Order. was not valid. Senator, what order? Senator Wong, final supplementary question. To settle. The minister has made my supplementary question is this: the minister has maintained that the government acted, and I quote, very quickly, and acted, quote, immediately. Given, oh well, I'm quoting her. That's not verbaling. I'll take that interjection. Given it has taken 76 AAT decisions over two years, a hundreds of secret rejected AAT appeals, and the suffering of thousands of Australians, how can the minister stand by her statement that the government acted immediately? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Um, well, Senator Wong, I will stand by my comments that the government acted quickly, um, and I will reiterate the fact that, that when, uh, upon finding uh, and being made aware that uh, income averaging was not a valid means by which to generate a debt, the government acted almost uh, straight away Order. to make sure that we ceased Order. that program and subsequently put Senator in place a program Senator to ensure that those people who had, had debts, uh, Order. debts Please raised your seat, as Senator a result— Rustin. Senator O'Neill. When I call you to order five times consecutively, you shouldn't keep counting. Senator Rustin, please continue. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, so what I will tell this place is, on the 19th of November 2019, the government announced that going forward, it would seek additional proof points when raising a debt. Uh, on the 29th of May this year, the government announced it would refund and zero approximately 470,000 debts raised using income averaging. As of the 30th of November, nearly all of those people have had their refunds completed. Order. Senator Birmingham. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Watt. Uh, I rise to take note of the answers given by Senators Rustin and Birmingham to the questions asked by Senators Gallagher, Chisholm and myself. Right now, across Australia, we see dozens of bushfires. There are some happening right now in my home state of Queensland, uh, in particular on the World Heritage listed Fraser Island. Uh, there are also fires in New South Wales and other states as well. It's another reminder already that we are in the natural disaster season. As well as those fires happening in some parts of the country right now, it's of course also coming time for the first anniversary in so many parts of Australia of the terrible black summer fires that we saw last year. Uh, to give one example that I don't think anyone will forget, uh, the town of Cabago devastated by fires, the scenes of those embarrassing visits by the Prime Minister after he came back from Hawaii, forcing people to shake his hands, scurrying off once they actually had something to say to him. Uh, and unfortunately, we still see residents and business owners in towns like Cabago being left behind by this government nearly a year after they experienced devastating bushfires. Only this week uh, on the Q&A program, which was, among other things, looking at how people are coping after the bushfires, a Cabago resident, Graham, said, and I quote, we've been politically and practically abandoned. That's how bushfire victims feel one year on from the bushfires uh, around which, of course, they were abandoned at the time by the Prime Minister and his government. To, go, to give one example of that, the National Bushfire Recovery Fund. This was the Prime Minister's great response to the bushfires when he pledged that he would spend $2 billion on a National Bushfire Recovery Fund to assist survivors uh, of the bushfires recover. Of course, we discovered at Senate Estimates earlier this year that, in fact, that was a notional fund, a fund that didn't really exist and would only ever reach $2 billion if it really had to. And what we've seen recently is that the government is claiming to have spent one to have spent 1.2 billion dollars of that bushfire recovery fund. But again, at estimates, we uncovered that this is another example of the government making claims that just don't stand up to scrutiny, because in fact that amount that the government claims to have spent 
from the Bushfire Recovery Fund includes half a billion dollars that it has yet to distribute to the states. I don't know why it's so important for this government to misrepresent what it's actually doing for bushfire victims. Why not just admit that what you've actually spent is $700 million from the fund and that you will be spending another $500 million, rather than going out there and claiming to have spent $1.2 billion when it's actually a lot less? This is why bushfire survivors find it so hard to trust this government and why they feel so abandoned and left behind by this government. Because for all of the promises that the government has made to look after people, they continue to be left behind. Of course, we're also seeing not only this government fail to respond properly in terms of the recovery from last year's bushfires, but they are again uh, demonstrating that they are not prepared for the coming disaster season. Today, I accompanied uh, the Labor leader, Anthony Albanese, and the member for Eden Monero, Christy McBain, uh, in Braidwood, about an hour and a bit away, where we met with cadets. RFS cadets who are being trained through the local, local high school. That community was also hit by the bushfires last year and is doing a good job of recovering. But what they're doing in actually training up young people to assist in the RFS is they're showing that they're preparing for what lies ahead this summer. And unfortunately, their effort is not being matched by their federal government. Again, to just give one example, uh, 18 months ago, in last year's federal budget, the government announced a $4 billion emergency response fund. We worked with the government last year to get the legislation through to, to establish that fund, and here we are 18 months on after it was announced, while fires are already happening around Queensland and New South Wales, and not a single cent has been sent from, spent from that emergency response fund. We are, we are already seeing fires in this country. We know from the Bureau of Meteorology that we face above normal numbers of cyclones and floods this year because of La Nina, and yet the Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, has a $4 billion fund sitting in his bank account that was established to help communities prepare for disasters that he hasn't spent, sent, spent a cent from. Now, the answer we always get from the government is that there are other funds available to assist people. Well, if that's the case, why are people still living in caravans in Cabago? Why are people in Bega and Cabago crowdfunding to build evacuation centres and toilet blocks? The fact is this government isn't delivering on its Thank announcements you, Senator yet Watt, again. Your time has expired. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. <coughs> uh, I too rise to take note. And, and, um, I would like to hear from those opposite, um, particularly who have been involved in active firefighting. I have been. Uh, down on the farm uh, and on my parents' property. And I know uh, my good friend Jim Molan is actively involved in his local fire service. And I would genuinely like to speak to those opposite because I think there is a really important level of knowledge to be gained from actually experiencing a fire front. And it's truly a extraordinarily frightening uh, and confronting experience. Uh, my father and I were protecting our property uh, one day from a fire and literally the pump stopped working uh, 30 seconds before the fire brigade, the bush fire brigade arrived. Uh, the, the gutters of our house were on fire. Um, so we certainly know what it means to both be in a, in a, in a dangerous fire situation. And why I say I'd like to speak to those opposite who have experienced that is because I cannot believe that those opposite are politicising disaster preparedness in the way that they are here today. Uh, aerial firefighting capacity is not a silver bullet. Anyone uh, who's been involved in firefighting, who's been involved on the ground in a bushfire zone, knows that, yes, they have a role to play, but they are in no way a silver bullet that can replace people on the ground. When my father was a young man, um, there were hundreds, uh, thousands of people involved in the forest industry uh, from where I grew up down in Pemberton. Uh, thousands of mill workers. In fact, the Warren district at that point was a safe labour seat because uh, the mill in town employed hundreds, thousands of blue collar workers. But when the Labor Party walked away from that industry, they walked away from those workers and the bush lost an extraordinary capacity for on-the-ground firefighting. Uh, at the same time, society has changed. We've developed the peri-urban areas. In the last decade, something like 300,000 new homes have been built 
in the peri-urban areas of Australia, i.e. completely surrounded in most cases by reasonably dense bush. Uh, that has created an environment where the risk of uh, disasters of this sort, um, including climactic conditions, are having a massive impact. But the idea that this is something we should politicise, that this is something that in any way we should seek to make political points out of, is it's very sad that the Labor Party uh, has, has, quite frankly, stooped to this low. The Emergency Response Fund, as, as some of my colleagues have, have noted in, in disorderly interjections, was voted for by the Australian Labor Party. Um, it it, it um, cannot be accessed until advice is received that it is required and that all other funding sources have been depleted. That is its purpose. That is what those opposite and, and those on this side voted for. But we do provide significant funding for di disaster preparedness from, uh, through other means. 130 million in Commonwealth funds under the National Disaster Risk Reduction Framework. 37 million on uh, telecommunications resilience. And um, again, we know how important it is if you can't contact uh, your local fire brigade, your local bushfire service, uh, your local emergency services in those situations, then, um, you know, being on your own in those circumstances is extraordinarily risky. Uh, $8 million to work with the states and territories to develop a public service mobile broadband capacity. $2 million for the emergency alert capacity. Uh, an enduring research capability with $88 million in new world-class disaster research centre. Uh, in, in the 30 seconds I have remaining, I think we've also got to make sure that we listen to those who had the experience. Uh, Roger Underwood from Western Australia was a good friend of my father's, spent a lot of time in the southwest forest of WA. He knew what it was like to fight fires on the ground. And I think the people in this place have an obligation to listen to people like Roger Underwood, people like Rich, Rick Snejak, people who actually had the experience, who have the experience of fighting these sort of fires on the ground. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Madam Deputy President. And whilst I'm tempted to take Senator Brockman's opportunity to talk about my uh, bush firefighting experience, I, I fear that is actually self-incriminating if I were to tell that story, so I might leave that one for another day. Uh, but what I did want to talk about is the economy. And uh, there was some welcome news that we saw today, uh, which is encouraging. Uh, but I did want to actually go to the substance of the way this government deals with it. And what we saw, and we saw it from the press conference from the Treasury, we saw it in this chamber today as well, and is how quick they are to get out there and take credit. Uh, as soon as they are able to, they get out there and they take credit. Uh, we saw evidence in that from the question from Senator Gallagher today uh, to the leader of the government in the Senate. And whilst there's some welcome news, there is still overwhelming uh, evidence about how difficult, he, difficult it is for families out there as they try to recover from the COVID pandemic. And I think you've got to look at how the government operates, because this actually goes to um, the way, at the end of the day, that they treat Australians, uh, they treat Australian families. Uh, we see it today with the economy. Uh, we also saw it earlier this year, and as we've also highlighted through question time today, with their response to bushfires. Uh, we've also seen it in how they've responded to sports rorts as well, uh, let alone robo-debt, where there's a lack of accountability. There's a lack of answering the questions that we put to them, uh, trying to hold this government to account so that Australian families can understand uh, how they are responding to these challenges. Uh, we also know that they avoid accountability. Uh, so they go out of their way, whether it's by uh, lodging PII claims, by not answering questions, um, by failing to front up uh, and actually level with the Australian people. And at the end of the day, when you're in government, there actually requires a component of that, where you have to be upfront with the Australian people. You actually have to be prepared to answer some of those tough challenges. And we see from this government, and it's from the Prime Minister down, he takes the lead role in this. Uh, always there, ready to announce the good news, but never actually to be up front with the Australian people. 
uh, or actually say we got this wrong, uh, like you should have done at the start of the year with bushfires, like they should have done uh, in response to sports rots. Actually been up front with the Australian people and said, we got this wrong, we're going to fix it up, we're going to fund those clubs that missed out. Uh, we've seen it with the bushfires again, a failure. You know, who could not be forced into action after what they saw at the start of this year? Still seeing it today with those communities that are suffering. Uh, we've also seen it in response to international events as well. Um, all Australians were relieved when Kylie Moore was released. Uh, and the foreign minister was all over it, uh, all through the media talking about it. Yet this week we've got a massive diplomatic incident with our biggest trading partner and the foreign minister has not fronted the media once. Uh, the shadow foreign minister has, has been prepared um, to get out and talk about Australia's interest in this regard, but the foreign minister has been silent uh, all over the news the other week about Kylie Moore being released but a failure to actually uh, show leadership. The member for Dawson, George Christensen, has done more media about this than the foreign minister, our biggest trading partner. This is going to cost jobs. Uh, this is going to have a negative impact on the economy. And the foreign minister is silent. So this is what we get from this government. Uh, when there's some good news around, you'll have the minister and others out there taking credit. But when there's actually the tough stuff to deal with, whether it's response to bushfires, uh, whether it's actually taking on responsibility for what happened with sports rots, whether it's the outrageous behaviour with robo-debt, the government go missing in action. Time and time again, this is what we see from them. So we know, uh, we welcome that there is some encouraging news on the economic front, but we know the reality for Australians and for Australian families is going to be extremely difficult over the next 12 months. We know that this government are actually going to redraw support early next year for those people who can't afford it. But that is what this government do. They actually don't make the hard decisions and the tough decisions and level with the Australian people and have a Prime Minister that actually is prepared to talk in the national interest. With this Prime Minister there's only one interest and that's himself. That is all he thinks about. He never thinks about the national interest. He never thinks about what's good for Australians. He only thinks about himself. And there's no better example of that then when you quarantine, you quarantine with your photographer. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. I'm coming up to 18 months being in this place. Uh, it's been a, a great honour to serve the great people of Western Australia. And uh, I think I can count on one hand how many times I've actually seen very serious and, and legitimate questions come from those opposite uh, that aren't covered in smear, questions that aren't covered in in, uh, in all sorts of innuendo and, 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 and very few questions that, uh, that might actually go to a, a point that is of significance for the Australian people. But what we see time and time again is, is people over here coming into this place and, 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 and describing things or putting uh, spin on, on particular topics and particular subjects to score, of course, a political point. And I don't think there's anything more shameful than coming into this place and trying to score a political point over something that is very, very serious to the people in this nation, particularly those that live in bushfire-prone areas. This line of attack is typical of Labor, thinking that blindly uh, committing to spending money can solve a problem with flashy promises and attack lines that really have very little substance at all. Labor's record in firefighting and land management is, is actually not very good. And Senator Brockman uh, spoke uh, about the importance of actually understanding what's involved. What's involved in dealing with bushfires, in understanding what's involved in making sure that we've got the preparedness for it. Uh, they and their friends in the Greens continually hamstring attempts to perform adequate Backburnings, and we're seeing this in, in states uh, controlled by Labor and where there's a real Greens Party influence in these states. And the disgraceful attempts in 2015 and 2016, where the, lay, where the, uh, uh, where, where the, the unions tried to unionise the, the, the CFA, the volunteers, that just demonstrates that uh, Labor sees bush firefighters, bush fire firefighters 
as, as just another political opportunity to boost union membership. Labor's record of politicising disaster relief is longer and stronger than their history of disaster management. Senator Murray Watt, the shadow minister for uh, emergency management, only last week accepted an invitation from the, to have a briefing from emergency management experts on our seasonal preparation. Just last week he accepted that. And that meeting, I understand, is happening a little later. But he moves today an MPI on this very subject, asks questions and then takes note of those answers here without ever actually allowing himself the opportunity to have the briefing. Oh, sorry. Um, Senator Watt. Senator um, Sullivan's misleading the, the chamber. Um, the briefing that I'm receiving this afternoon is actually about new legislation that the government intends Thank to you, introduce. Thank you, Senator Watt. Um, please continue, Senator uh, O'Sullivan. But what we're seeing here, in any case, is a politicisation of a very, very serious, serious issue that this nation, of course, faced bigger than any, you know, any time in our history, really, when you compare previous fire seasons uh, you know, to the one that we had last year. I want to just talk briefly in the remaining time that I have, just to give some reassurance uh, to the Australian people of what this government is actually doing. Now, we accept that uh, the, the primary role of dealing with bushfires and bushfire management on the ground is delivered by state governments. And this government doesn't want, as the federal Commonwealth government, doesn't want to interfere with that at all, but rather provide the necessary support and resources to assist. Uh, and that can be done in many ways. And one way is through the Defence Force. So during uh, this year, we're, we're going to ensure that the ADF is poised to respond as quickly and efficiently as possible. It's streamlined and simplified its processes for state and territories to receive that support. Uh, we've set up joint task forces for each state and territory. We've exer exercised and validated its reserve call-out processes. And we've conducted response planning exercises with the states and territories and with the Australian government agencies, including the EMA and Services Australia. We've streamlined these processes so that we can act quickly when it's called upon by the states to ensure that that support is there. Uh, there are uh, many other things that uh, this government is doing. I haven't got time uh, in the 14 seconds that I've got, but Services Australia stands ready. Uh, we're, we're ready to, to deal uh, with any outbreak and, and dealing, of course, with people that require assistance from the Commonwealth Government through services and, and uh, funding, and that's there. Thank and you, Senator thank you. O'Sullivan. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Well, today we've heard Senator Birmingham crowing, crowing about the state of the economy, uh, literally shouting in this chamber, shouting about the government's achievements. When we know that people are struggling to get back on their feet, when we know that people are crying out for a big and bold jobs plan, uh, when we know that people want a big picture plan, a plan of hope for their future, not slogans like the government's comeback slogan, a slogan that got a great workout uh, in the Senate today. Uh, and while I was sitting in the chamber um, hearing this slogan, thrown around over and over and over again, uh, the government's comeback, I had the chance to look up the dictionary definition of this term, uh, the government's new favourite comeback term. Uh, and here it is, comeback, a return by a well-known person, especially an entertainer. An entertainer, well, Australians do not need an entertainer in chief. Uh, we don't need an ad man in chief. Uh, what Australians need is a leader, a leader to take the country through this crisis. A leader with a plan, not a leader with a focus grouped slogan. We need a leader with a big and bold jobs plan, a plan that we are still yet to see from this Prime Minister a plan that Australians need more than ever, 
We know that the Reserve Bank has said that it expects unemployment to stay high and above pre-pandemic levels until the end of 2022. So there is nothing to crow about here while people are still struggling to get back on their feet, while people are still hurting. There is no time for slogans. While 2.4 million people are unemployed or underemployed, and while the unemployment queues are continuing to grow, and while we continue in this country to experience record low wages growth, low wages growth that began well before the pandemic in this country uh, under this government. Uh, and there is no time to crow and there is no time to shout about achievements in this chamber whilst three million Australians are relying on JobKeeper and job, and job Seeker to survive. Uh, and many of these people are the very people that the Morrison government is leaving behind. And this government, of course, finds it all too easy to leave people behind. Just look at the millions who missed out on JobKeeper in the first place when they needed it the most. The casuals, the freelancers, the temporary migrants, uh, and so many more. Look at the hundreds of thousands of workers that the government has just left out of their plans for the JobMaker hiring credit. Uh, indeed, almost a million Australians aged over 35 have been left behind. Uh, and think about those Australians on JobKeeper and JobSeeker who are being left behind in just a matter of a few weeks' time when their incomes are cut while they are still struggling to get back on their feet. Uh, while their incomes are cut, despite the warnings from the OECD, despite the warnings from the Reserve Bank, the IMF, uh, and every prominent economist that you could name who says that more needs to be done, that we need to maintain incomes and that we shouldn't be ripping support out of the economy too early. This government is leaving people behind in this recovery, just like the government is leaving people behind who have been devastated by bushfires in this country. Uh, but let's think about what Senator Rustin said today. According to the minister, uh, we're committed to standing by people affected by bushfires. Well, I doubt that people devastated by the fires last summer, who are still waiting for support, who are still waiting for the funding to rebuild, who are crowdfunding the things that they need to rebuild and get their lives moving again, are going to be impressed by that statement or are going to be comforted by that statement. The minister said today communities received funding immediately. Again, I doubt devastated communities who are still waiting for support are going to be comforted by that answer or indeed believe that answer from the minister today. Thank you, Senator Walsh. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Watt to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Seward. President, I rise today to take note of the minister's answers to my question, Minister Rustin's answers to my questions about the um, job seeker payment uh, as it relates to the coronavirus supplement and the Productivity Commission's report on mental health. First off, I asked the minister, I thought it was a fairly simple question, is, the government, is it government policy for people on the job seeker payment to live in poverty? Now, the minister spent two minutes not answering, very carefully not answering the question. Filibustering, I would call it, but did not answer that question. So given the evidence that is before us, I'll answer the question, and that is yes, it obviously is government policy that people on the job seeker payment live in poverty because, in fact, their actions speak louder than words and their actions are, with the cut to the coronavirus supplement that has already occurred, people are now living below the poverty line and with the changes and the lowering of the coronavirus supplement that comes in on the 1st of January 2021, in just a couple of months, or less than two months' time, they will definitely be in living in poverty. They'll be dropped further into poverty. So, yes, it is government policy that people should live on the job seeker payment in poverty. The minister also then complete, basically really didn't answer and ignored my question about all those children who will have a much deprived Christmas 
because their parents will be very aware that they have limited money at the present time, but even more limited when they come to the 1st of January, a week after Christmas, and their payments are cut again and they will be living in poverty. Now, I just wanted to quickly touch on the Productivity Commission report because this is very important when discussing these issues. Because the Productivity Commission's report, which I asked the minister about, does she agree that the low rate of income support and punitive mental health obliga uh, mutual obligations are making Australians' mental health worse? That's what the Productivity Commission says in their report on mental health. And the minister said, yes, obviously, oh, yes, they'll take their time. They're looking at the report. They'll take their time, um, but they need to take some time to review the report. Now. This was released on the 16th of November, but what the community needs to, to realise and know is that the government's had that report since the 30th of June this year. In other words, in time for their budget in October to, con to respond in a much more uh, formal and a much stronger way than the commitments they made in the budget. And while, of course, the commitments made in October are welcome, they are piecemeal and they are not done in response to the Productivity Commission report. But how this affects job seekers and those on income support particularly is because the Productivity Commission report did find that the, most, the mutual obligations requirements and, uh, and our income support system does negatively impact and aggravate the symptoms and increase distress of those with poor mental health. The system itself is hurting people, which is why I asked the minister that question. Our income support system and the punitive approach to mutual obligations is aggravating people's ill mental health. It, the outcomes from uh, Job Active for participants in Job Active who have mental ill health are significantly worse, with 82% sp spending more than 12 months on the program compared to 64% for the wider Job Active population. It noted the challenges that people with ongoing mental ill health face when trying to re enter the workforce. It, it found that people receiving income support were more than three times uh, likely to have depression than those that are paid employment. So we know, we know that people on the job seeker payments and who don't have work are more likely to have mental ill health. But we have a system that then aggravates that mental ill health and in fact in and of itself makes them stay longer on the support on the system because the system is making them sicker making them more unwell and the government couldn't and the minister would not then answer the question about whether she in fact agreed with the productivity commission's report which makes me deeply concerned that the government is ignoring the fact that the very system that they say they've put in place to help people find work is making people more unwell again Thank pointing you, to the fact Seward, reform your time is needed. has expired so the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Seawitt to take note be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Are there any notices?